Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Before I begin officially, uh, let me just take a moment to acknowledge the role of certain colleagues uh, here in the House of Commons in today's events. Although uh, the responsibility for the apology is ultimately mine alone, uh, mine alone, there are uh, several of my colleagues who do deserve the credit. Uh, first of all, for their hard work and professionalism, I do want to thank both the Minister of Indian Affairs and his predecessor, now the Minister of Industry. Uh, these uh, gentlemen have both uh, uh, been strong and passionate advocates, not just of today's actions, but also of the historic, historic Indian residential school settlement uh, that our government has signed. Second, Second, I would be amiss if I didn't acknowledge my former colleague from Caribou to Coton, Philip Mayfield, who was a determined voice in our caucus for a very long time for meaningful action on this sad episode of our history. And last but certainly not least, I do want to thank my colleague, the leader of the New Democratic Party. For the past year, in fact the past year and a half, that he has spoken to me with regularity and with great conviction on the need for this apology. His advice, given across party lines and in confidence, has been persuasive and has been greatly appreciated. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The treatment of children in Indian residential schools is a sad chapter in our history. For more than a century, Indian residential schools separated over 150,000 Aboriginal children from their families and communities. The 1870s, the federal government, partly in order to meet its obligations to educate Aboriginal children, began to play a role in the development and administration of these schools. Two primary objectives of the residential school system were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their home, families, traditions, and cultures, and to assimilate them into the dominant culture. These objectives were based on the assumption that Aboriginal cultures and spiritual beliefs were inferior and unequal. Indeed, some saw it, as was infamously said, to kill the Indian in the child. Today, we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong has caused great harm and has no place in our country. Today we recognize that this policy of assimilation was wrong, has caused great harm, and has no place in our country. 132 federally supported schools were located in every province and territory except Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island. These were operated as joint ventures with Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian, and United Churches. The Government of Canada built an educational system in which very young children were often forcibly removed from their homes, often taken far from their communities. Many were inadequately fed, clothed, and housed. All were deprived of the care and nurturing of their parents, grandparents, and communities. First Nations, Inuit, and Métis languages and cultural practices were prohibited in these schools. Tragically, some of these children died while attending residential schools, and others never returned home. The government now recognizes that the consequences of the Indian residential schools policy 
were profoundly negative and that this policy has had a lasting and damaging impact on Aboriginal culture, heritage, and language. While some former students have spoken positively about their experience